Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. No, follow me, line, Professor McGonagall told the first years, and follow me. Feeling oddly as though his legs had turned to lead, Harry got into line with Ron behind him, and they walked out of the chamber, back across the hall, and through a pair of double doors into the great hall. Harry had never imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in mid-air over four long tables, where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering gold plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up here, so that they came to a halt in a line facing the other students, with the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the ghost shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, It's bewitch to look like the sky outside. I read it in a Hogwarts of history. It was hard to believe there was a ceiling there at all, and that the Great Hall didn't simply open onto the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of the stool, she put a pointed wizard's hat. This hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Petunia wouldn't have let it in the house. For a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then the saucer hat began to sing. The Salton Hat then sorted the first years into the local houses. Remember them? Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw and Slytherin. Harry was relieved to be sorted into Gryffindor, not Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the Salton Hat away. Harry looked down at his empty gold plate. He had only just realised how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasty seemed ages ago. Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He'd never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops, lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, fries, Yorkshire puddings, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and for some strange reason, peppermint humbugs. The Dursley had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything, except the peppermints, and began to eat. It was all delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough, sadly, watching Harry cut up a steak. Can't you? Well, I haven't eaten for nearly 500 years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington, at your service. Resident Ghost of Gryffindor. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brother's told me about you. You're nearly Headless Nick. When they asked how he could be nearly headless, the Gryffindor ghost enjoyed showing them. Looking pleased at the stunned faces, look, look at, looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, nearly headless Nick, Nick flipped his head back onto his neck, coughed and said, <coughs> So, new Gryffindor House Championship this year. Gryffindors have never gone so long without winning. Slytherins have got the cup six years in a row. The bloody Baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a ghost sitting there with blank staring eyes, a gaunt face and robes stained with blood. He was right next to Malfoy, who Harry was pleased to see. Didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangement. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later, the desserts appeared. Blocks of ice cream and every flavour you could think of. Apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs and jam donuts, trifle, strawberries, jello, rice pudding. As Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. My dad's a muggle. Mom didn't tell him she was a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville? said Ron. 
well, my gran brought me up and she is a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was an all muggle for ages. My grand uncle, my great uncle Algie kept trying to catch me off guard and force some magic, magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned. But nothing happened until I was eight. You should have seen their faces when I got in here. They thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see. Great Uncle Algie was so pleased to bought me my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start right away. There's so much to learn. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with gr greasy black hair, a hooked nose and sallow skin. I think you can all guess who that teacher is. I hope you're all keeping safe and I can't wait to see when we're going back. 